Howdy. I am about to welcome you into the Temple of Time. So, so take a deep breath, relax, and join me on this journey to sleep. I managed to book Sienna Miller for that part of the video. No big deal. Uh, partially in exchange for me telling you about her new feature on this season of Sleep Sound, the very ASMR podcast produced by Audible. There's a link to it in my description for you to check it out. Now, this show is... Is the last <sighs> frontier between land and water. Yeah, uh, okay, well, I, I'm just going to do a solo from here. Uh, Sienna, you'll make me look bad. It's just cool seeing sleep content being produced at this sort of level. The audio quality is unreal. The immersive environments and soundscapes are very much to my tastes. And they're booking super top-tier talent. I mean, yeah, they haven't booked your boy. But uh, I assume they're, I assume they're gonna. I must have, I must have just missed their, their phone call or something. So, if after this video, you're still not sufficiently relaxed, throw Sleep Sound with Sienna Miller on your playlist. The link's here. And thank you, Audible, for the partnership. All right. Play me out, Sienna. A reminder of the power and beauty of the elements. I had the extremely bright idea this morning of buying a bunch of clocks um, as a concept for a video about time because I thought that uh, a bunch of ticking clocks would be relaxing and nice sounds and just, you know, a bunch of them together would create that very nice sort of rustle. However, I didn't account for the, uh, the the fact that ticking clocks are actually enormously stressful. So, I've spent the past ten minutes taking all the batteries out of the clocks, and uh, this is the uh, this is the concept instead. Welcome to the Temple of Time, uh, a place beyond time, where where we are instead needing to. Shut everything off, shut everything down, power off our internal clock, all the anxiety from the day. Uh, take the batteries out, as it were, and exist timeless. I've done loads of time puns already in my previous Grail Watch video, so I'll try not to make so many uh, today. Now, in here, this timeless temple, a place where our brains stop ticking. You and I are suspended in a bit of a limbo. A place where we can have a conversation and not worry about whether or not it's too long or whether or not it's going to affect what else we need to get done today or anything. You and I can just chat. How was your day? Was it a good day? Did you get things done? Is that even important? Here, in this timeless temple. I don't think it matters. And nothing will matter for, I would say, uh, hours or minutes or seconds. But this would be all to acknowledge time's existence here. And it simply doesn't. It simply doesn't exist. It's not a, con it's not a concept that we acknowledge in the timeless temple which I prefer now, to Temple of Time. Here, this is all that matters. Me, you, and my watches. Because I bought all these clocks, sort of as a bit of a dressing for a watch collection video. Because I wanted to do something really simple and just talk to you about 
horology about all things watches, watchmaking, watchmakers, and the beauty that is time keeping. So, please, settle in, relax. If it's your evening, just get a tea or something and uh, cuddle up with a nice blanket and just float with me in timelessness, in our timeless temple of time. And watch with me <laughs> what makes these things tick. I think I'm getting a bit overwhelmed by the watch buttons, to be honest. Are you ready to dive into my collection with me? Can you give me a countdown? Correct. Trick question. You can't. Because that would be to acknowledge the existence of time. But here, yeah, there is no time. No time at all. There is only watches. It's creaky. Et voila. In no particular order of importance, perhaps just in the order or reverse order from uh, when I acquired them, I'm just going to talk to you and uh, feel free to ask any questions you may want to ask, perhaps in the comments, because I may not hear you currently. Feel free to relax and just have me on in the background, probably. Uh, this, we'll start with the one on my wrist, with, as you can hear, a very high quality Velcro watch. This is called the Moon Swatch, and for the uninitiated, for those who don't perhaps follow the watch market as keenly as I do, um, the Moon Swatch was probably the most talked about watch of 2022 last year. I'm acknowledging the existence of time by saying year, but I hope that in this moment with me, this frozen moment, you'll forgive me. The Moon Swatch, if you know your watches, is a take on the Speedmaster Moon Watch, which is probably, arguably, the most iconic watch one of the most iconic watches in Omega's watch uh, repertoire collection. Uh, what, I, what do I want to say there? The Omega Speedmaster earned its stripes by being the first watch ever on the moon, allegedly. It was worn by, I think, Buzz Aldrin. And, oh goodness, do Omega let you know it. In every bit of marketing that they've done over the past several decades, the first watch on the moon. Very, very cool achievement, for sure. But um, really, as a marketing angle, one fears it's perhaps a little overplayed. But that said, it's a £6,000 watch, um, or whatever that is in dollars, or whatever the currency uh, you use, um, which is an expensive watch. So a rather genius brand collaboration between Omega and sister company Swatch, I'm sure you've possibly heard of both, led to this toy looking thing, which was uh, termed the Moon Swatch, rather cleverly, uh, and is a 200 pound version of the Speedmaster. It feels very much like a uh, 100 pound watch, it's um, plastic, they call it bioceramic, but it's effectively plastic, and um, doesn't really feel like a, uh, like a beautiful sapphire crystal meets stainless steel uh, luxury watch, but that's fine, that's not what I was in the market for. I was in the market for a watch that matched this rather bizarre yellow period of my life that's happening. You can call it a midlife crisis. You can call it a quarter life crisis if one's being charitable about one's age. But I've got, I've got, I need, I have yellow Crocs, and so I needed, I needed a yellow watch. 
and uh, and therefore uh, this happened and it's the latest watch on my wrist it's got a beautiful velcro strap which perhaps you'll indulge me in making some noise with Now, anyway, this is the moon swatch. I feel like I'm drifting. Let's reposition myself. And actually, get some coziness up in there. See? Yellow. What's wrong with me? I have no idea why this was the most talked about and hyped watch of uh, last year. However, they're still very, very hard to come by. They're very hard to buy at a boutique, a Swatch boutique, and they are very um, expensive on the second-hand market. I don't know. The watch industry is very weird when it comes to supply and demand. You might have heard of the insane price dynamics of Rolex, Patek Philippe, uh, AP, you know, the various sort of... Uh, mainstream luxury brands it's very hard to get a rolex watch uh, even if you have a purchase history with uh, your authorized dealer it can take years and will take years for you to be get, for you to get any of their um sort of flagship watches be it a daytona submariner any rolex watch very very tricky so anyway Weird price dynamics apply with this too, but if you are in the market for a £200 watch that feels like it should be about £100, but you quite like the brand heritage, you quite like the colours, not a bad choice. Also, I'm not trying to sell you anything, <laughs> so I should uh, lay on the sale a little less thick. Do you like how I've um, lit up the watch box as well, by the way? <sighs> Just some leftover touches from my watch video, the Grail watch. I'm just going to promote my own video there. Okay. Now, the second most recent watch in my watch journey is possibly my favourite piece the piece I would wear my daily beater, the one that I would wear the most often. It is called the Seagull 1963, and I hope that I've got that right, but I'm sure you'll let me know if I haven't. The Seagull 1963 is a particularly cool watch for several reasons, and not just because of how it looks. I'm not sure how well you can see that, given how bizarrely I've chosen to light myself today. but. It's a shame too, because I want to be able to show you this rather beautiful open case back, which which shows the iconic seagull movement in it. But anyway, for next time, um, it is iconic because it was the first chronograph, I believe, developed by the Chinese Air Force in 1963, funnily enough, and uh, chronographs. Uh, if you don't know, uh, a complication where you press this button here, which is a rather, rather satisfying little click noise, and then it acts as a stopwatch. Other examples of a complication for a watch would be where it does anything that isn't simply tell the time. So a watch might uh, tell you the date. That would be a date complication which could refer to something else too. Um, it might, uh, like on a dive watch, have a rotating bezel, which acts sort of like a timer, where you rotate the bezel to show you how much time you're going to be spending underwater. Um, this, particularly for use on like Air Force watches and things, or uh, if you're a race car driver, very handily stops and starts the stopwatch. Now, this is a manual wound mechanical movement and at risk of defeating the concept of 
our timeless temple of no time. I'm going to wind it up so I can show you the ticking chronograph. And it's just a very cool, very iconic bit of watchcraft and wizardry. So, that is the Seagull, 1963. One hopes. One hopes it's actually called that. Now, the question on everyone's lips. Where's my blanket gone? No, th I mean, that's not going to be the question on anyone's lips, apart from mine. Uh, the question on everyone's lips is Alice. What's your most expensive watch? What's your fanciest watch, you know? I know how you work, I know how you tick. Uh, I'm saving that one till last, obviously. This, if I can actually put it on, is a G-Shock. Now, you probably remember having a G-Shock from when you were a kid. This is a uh, more modern example of a G-Shock. It is the affectionately termed the Casio. Casio uh, meets the uh, Royal Oak, which is the flagship watch by Audemars Piguet. And it is named as such because of its hexagonal, octagonal bezel on the front. There isn't too much to say about this watch. This is sort of my like photo shoot watch or my working watch. You know, you don't mind sort of bashing it around a little bit. You can shower with it. You can jump in the pool with it. You can go to the beach with it, whatever. It just can take anything that you throw at it, which is why G-Shocks are very, very cool. And I just like how it looks, but it was a present to myself. I bought it in New York as a bit of a, uh, a pat on the back, I guess, for reaching 200,000 subs. So, thank you guys for uh, f forcing me, really, to buy this watch. <laughs> I don't tend to do those things, you know, um, those little uh, things, that you, the ways that you treat yourself in order to sort of mark an accomplishment or an occasion or a moment or something like that. But with this one, I thought that I ought to indulge myself and possibly mark those small little achievements more. Because, you know, those are the things that you, the purchases really, that you look back and go, oh yeah, I remember that time that I was in New York, I hit 200,000 subs. And I, uh, that felt good. So, that's this watch. I would like to say that my watch journey has happened, spanned many, many years, and marked several different points in my life. But really, it's a very um, recent pursuit. So, the watch collection, state of the collection, will change a lot over the coming years. It's good to have something to, to fixate on, I guess. What am I doing? How are you doing there? Are you comfy? Just checking in. Are you cozy? Like me, are you lying on the floor? I'm worried that I'm a little bit worried that my back's not gonna work when I try and get up, but it's okay. These two watches are uh, in all of the ways my most special watches. They are uh, certainly not uh, in any way the most expensive watches. In fact, I'm sure that they are the cheapest watches in my collection by a mile. However, these, a Citizen Quartz watch and a Timex Expedition Quartz watch were my grandfather's watches. Now, if you've seen a video of mine before, you will see my grandfather's watch mentioned in many of them. I quite like sometimes having that sort of uh, constant in my videos reminds me of that, that, that there was a book from my childhood where you would look through the pictures it was a, it was a kid's book and in every 
photo, in every illustration, sorry, there would be a clock somewhere hidden on one of the pages. I like the idea that a lot of my stories have as their sort of MacGuffin, as an object that's a sort of plot catalyst or something, I guess. Um, I like the idea that my grandfather's watch is a bit of a constant. This was granddad's, this was grandpa's, and, uh, yeah, might wear them occasionally to like a family wedding or something like that. I mean, watches as heirlooms has existed for uh, well over a hundred years. Um, the idea of passing down a watch from generation to generation, which is, I think, part of the appeal of watches. <laughs> that particularly mechanical watches, rather than a quartz watch, can last generations. It's this tiny piece of machinery on your wrist that, in theory, if it's well serviced, it shouldn't ever die. So, these are special. Granddads. And grandpas. Okay, we are one watch away from my first watch that I bought myself, and certainly my fanciest. Um, this, however, was a £5 watch I bought at a fair. There's not much to say about this. It's very scratched. It's a quartz 80s Casio. It's really, really uncomfortable. And I like it a lot. That's all there is to it. Now, the jewel in the crown of uh, my watch collection was my first ever watch, and certainly my first and probably only uh, luxury watch. This is perhaps a little dry, but right at the beginning of um, the cost of living crisis, I became very aware that uh, commodities and gold and whatever uh, became a sort of hedge of value in a um, in a sort of classic time of inflation and uh, during a bear market and things. So I started, like many uh, folks did, looking for an alternate alternative investment, and I chose to assume my final form to evolve into a watch guy, an insufferable watch guy. I'm going to close this box because I've wound those watches now and they are ticking. And time doesn't exist here. You know what does exist. This Tudor black bag. You will have seen it in the Grail watch video that I keep uh, trying to flog to you again. Um, what I don't have in my collection is that very beautiful Rolex president. I borrowed that for for the video. No, I don't. Uh, I don't see myself really as a Rolex sort of guy. Tudor, however, I think of as a very very cool brand, and this one is uh, the particularly special Harrods edition, which has a beautiful olive green bezel, which I'll need to uh, properly show you in slightly better light at some point. Now, beyond the practical reasons for buying this watch, I bought this watch because I enjoyed the story of going to get it. It's a waitlisted watch, so you usually would have to put your name down on a list and wait for 12, 13, 14 months to be given, be, uh, to, to receive the call from Harrods to say that your watch is in stock. Which really amps up the allure. I mean, it's all slightly superficial and very weird and materialistic. But this stuff works, you know? Um, and I was told all of this by multiple YouTubers and various sources. I'd had my eye on a watch like this for many, many, many months. So when I went into the Harrods boutique to uh, check it out, I spent about an hour chatting 
to the watch dealer, the salesman, the only person in the Tudor boutique. And we talked about watches and we talked about the state of the industry and I was very, very new to all of this and didn't have my first watch yet. And after an hour of chatting, this young guy who clearly uh, wanted to make my first watch a reasonably memorable one, told me that instead of being on this wait list for 12, 13, 14 months, that actually someone who was going to be picking up theirs today didn't arrive, and that I could have theirs instead. No. This could have been just a very good sales technique. However, from what I understand from everyone else who has tried to buy this watch on YouTube or whatever, the waitlist is, is real, and this person seemingly was just trying to do me a solid. And that's the narrative I'm choosing to believe. And so he, uh, he, he made... Uh, a rather quick customer of me on the day and I walked away with this Tudor black bag now you might be tempted to say that's just a watch no 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 see it is not just a watch it is a whole watch journey and it leads me now to my first ever watch This final watch in my collection it is called a Jemis, a Jemis, not entirely sure. And it doesn't even fit on my uh, not child size wrists, um, but it was my first ever watch, or it could have been one of my parents and uh, was given to me at some point. I'm unsure, and I don't even have that many memories of wearing it. But I do have one. One very strong memory from when I was a kid. And this watch just represents that. That one memory. And so, arguably, this is where the whole collection journey, my watch journey, started. And that's it for now. We can put a pin in it, because in reality, it's a living and breathing thing. That I'm sure, in a year, will look completely different. How are you? How was that? How are you feeling? Okay? Have you been thinking about your day? Hopefully, the answer is no. I've been just chilling at the timeless temple beyond time. And thank you from behalf of the temple and myself to you. I hope that when time does start ticking again, you'll now feel sufficiently well-equipped enough to deal with it. Now, I have no confidence that my back is going to let me get up, so this is me now. Hope you are equally wrapped up, and I'll see you in the next one.